Um, today, in getting to the, the, the birth of the nuclear age, uh, birth of the atomic age, I'm going to give you a very, very quick review of the things I've talked about in a couple of previous lectures already so that you've got some perspective. I use this photo a lot because this really represents the turning point in modern history in Japan, which was the Meiji Restoration, when in 1868, after a two-year war, the emperor of uh, Japan was reinstated to his full authority after um, hundreds of years, 700 years actually, of simply being a figurehead. The commitment of the Meiji Emperor, and when he was re, re, uh, restored in 1868, was to make Japan a modernized Western nation with a modern military. Uh, to do that, because they lacked the, the resources, the mineral resources, particularly oil, coal, and uh, had very little iron, that the, they saw the need to try to access those resources from elsewhere. So in 1894-95, they fought a war with, with China, Japan versus China, for control of Korea, which the Japanese won. Then because the Russians stepped in and tried to really keep the Japanese from taking advantage of some of that, the Japanese and Russians fought a war in 1904 and 1905, which has been called the most important war that everybody, nobody remembers anymore. The Russo-Japanese War um, fundamentally changed not only East Asia, but a lot of the relationships that existed in the world that affected later wars, the First and Second World War especially. In 1910, Japan annexed Korea, took it over completely, um, and also began to be much more active after they defeated the Russians in Manchuria. In 1931, Japan created a pretext by which they uh, sent their troops into Manchuria and really took over this whole northeastern corner of China turned it into the puppet kingdom of Manchukuo, they called it, um, and really made it a, a colony uh, to, uh, to Japan. And then, over the period of the next six years, uh, Japan continued to get more and more aggressive until 1937, when they declared war for a second time against China. And so we have the second Sino-Japanese War, which is recognized really as the beginning of the Second World War, because that the war against, between Japan and China uh, established the what's called the Indian-Burma-China front of the, or theater of the Second World War. The Chinese still feel like the war started in 1931 when the Japanese sent their troops in in order to take over Manchuria and create Man Manchukuo. So they call it the 14-year war because it ended in 1945 when the Japanese were defeated. Throughout the 20s and 30s, Japan really struggled because uh, the Western powers did not want them in China, and so they began to embargo them, they froze their assets in the United States, and more and more, the military uh, feeling in Japan led to a militant, nationalistic, imperialistic kind of feeling, so that the military eventually, uh, in 1941, completely took over the government. There were no other opposition parties. The, gov the government was the military in Japan during that time. And the, the commitment was to an imperialistic expansion, that they would do what they had seen for 100 years, the Western powers do, and that is take what they needed if they were not able to trade with, for it. In the 1930s, the Great Depression severely hit Japan because it limited the ability of all nations to be able to trade. It affected the whole planet. And so the military extremists gained, gained even more authority in the late 30s and into the early 40s, until 1941 when General Hideki Tojo, a general of the Imperial Japanese Army, was made the Prime Minister. So uh, this sort of imperial growth, I've given you a background on that, and then in order to try to stop the United States Pacific Fleet from interfering with their plans to take over this region of East Asia, they attacked Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December 1941. At the same time, within seven hours of that, they also attacked Wake Island, Guam, and Philipp the Philippines, which were other uh, possessions of the United States and the Pacific, and British possessions in Hong Kong, Singapore, and Burma. I've shown you these maps before. The Japanese advanced through the Pacific, and for the first uh, five months, they seemed to be unstoppable. Uh, they, they won every victory, they accomplished every goal, up until the Coral Sea. And they actually technically won the tactical aspects of the Coral Sea battle, but they were prevented from moving into Port Moresby and New Guinea, and so therefore the first time that they returned 
Then in June of 1942, the Battle of Midway was a major turning point because the Japanese lost four aircraft carriers and numerous other capital ships, many of their seasoned pilots, and at that point, we found out after the war was over, there were confidential communiques between uh, the leading military, particularly the Imperial Japanese Navy, saying that after Midway, they recognized there was very little chance they would ever have of winning the war. So from, from June of 1942, until August of 1945, over three years, the, the war continued even though the Japanese senior commanders knew that they almost certainly could not win the war. Uh, eventually it became a desire on their part to make the war as costly to the Allied forces as they could in the hopes that they could get a better uh, conditions of surrender uh, rather than unconditional surrender, which is what eventually happened. And of course, uh, over the next three years, the efforts of the Allied forces, and because of the Pacific Fleet being the strongest fleet in, the, in the, this part of the world, the United States was leading the way, but Australians, British, others were very involved in this as well. Um, the movement island hopping across the Pacific to try to get, uh, get to the home islands of Japan. In June of 1944, um, they introduced the the Super Fortress, the B-29 Super Fortress, and they began strategic bombing of the cities in the home islands of Japan. Uh, they had captured Tinian and uh, the islands along that chain. Uh, Guam was part of that, but from Tinian they were able to launch air raids over Tokyo and other major cities and then return because uh, almost 4,000 miles was the range of the B-29. Well, they ended up significantly destroying 67 major Japanese cities with the firebombing and uh, somewhere between 330 and 900,000 people were killed in the firebombing uh, of the cities. This is before the nuclear weapons and uh, a half million more were injured. The uh, destruction all the way th along as as there was more and more destruction as the battles were getting closer and closer to the home islands of Japan the expectation was that at some point, Japan would decide that rather than have the massive destruction of their cities, rather than have the horrendously bloody battles, because the closer they got, the worse the battles were, Iwo, uh, Guadalcanal, Iwo Jima, and then Okinawa, Okinawa being the bloodiest battle of all. Um, it, 241,000 dead in Okinawa between the allies that were involved, primarily American Marines, the Japanese, and the Okinawan civilians. And so, looking at all of that, um, there was no indication of that Japan was intending to surrender. Okinawa is only 340 miles from the home islands. It was to be a forward base for the invasion of the home islands. But more than half of the casualties of the Pacific War, uh, that is the ocean side of the Pacific War, not counting China, more than half the casualties occurred in the last three to four months of the Pacific War. It got harder and harder and harder. The determination of the Japanese military, the, both the Navy and the Army on ground, uh, was they were more and more determined, and the Japanese had a 94% casual uh, fatality rate in Okinawa. 94% of their troops were killed. And so uh, all of this uh, led the Allies to believe that there was no end in sight in terms of any willingness of the Japanese to surrender. There's never been a country or a military that has suffered as severely um, and still show no indication of being able to with, uh, being willing to withdraw or surrender. Even uh, Germany did not undergo the kind of devastation that uh, Japan was experiencing, and yet still there was no surrender. Um, one of the other signs of determination, or you might even say desperation, was the advent of the kamikaze pilots, that they were um, less experienced pilots, because most of the really experienced pilots had been killed. Uh, they didn't have the best planes, and so they were using lesser planes, and the intention of trying to destroy American shipping by American ships by use of the suicide bombers. At the Battle of Okinawa, they sank, uh, kamikaze flyers sank 38 ships. They damaged 368 others and killed almost 5,000 sailors. And uh, this was a sign of Rather than surrender, they would rather sacrifice their pilots. Uh, also, this, this image here, I mentioned yesterday in the uh, Battle of Okinawa, 1,780 uh, boys as young as 14 years old 
were recruited by the Japanese military to fight either front line or to be used as suicide bombers. Half of those 1,780 were killed in the Battle of Okinawa, and there was, uh, there was indication, which later proved to be true from film documentation and whatnot, that the Japanese were training civilians, including children, um, to try to fight against the Allied forces if, when, if and when they landed on the home islands. We have video of young girls being taught to charge um, foreigners with sharpened bamboo stakes, and um, it was quite horrendous. There was an order at that time that boys as young as 14 and girls as young as 17 could be recruited into active military service. So it was a very, uh, there was no indication uh, that the Japanese really were serious about surrendering, despite all the destruction, despite the what would appear to be acts of desperation, but certainly of determination. And so the plan, Operation Downfall, the plan to um, invade the home islands, the expectation was that in November of 1945, using the Okinawa, which is 340 miles from the home islands, would be used as a primary um, staging area for the invasion of Kyushu, the southern part where the the kamikaze pilots were leaving from, the, the town of Chiran, and then once a beachhead was established here, they would attack at Tokyo on Honshu Island. Uh, that was the plan, but as I said before, the estimates, um, they had many different estimates, were between, um, well, up to a million Americans, or allied forces, but the primarily Americans were to be involved in this, would be killed, and up to four million total casualties. As I said yesterday, they had, they, they had made up 500,000 Purple Heart medals in order to award them to the number of people they expected. A Purple Heart is a medal for someone who's wounded in combat, and so they expected to need at least a half a million or more uh, of those medals. The, uh, the thought was that there would be between five and 10 million Japanese fatalities, not only military, but civilian. They discovered after the war that the vice chief of the Imperial Japanese Navy had actually estimated 20 million Japanese dead. His estimates were double what the American estimates were of the Japanese fatalities. Um, so all of this created a sense that Japan was not, despite all the destruction, despite the, um, the proximity that the Allied forces, particularly the U.S. Navy, uh, had gotten to the, the home islands, despite the plan for the invasion. And by the way, the, the, um, the assault on Kyushu, the Japanese knew exactly where the Allies were coming in. There was no question about that. They knew that that was the only thing that made sense. And so they were fully expecting an invasion to happen in Kyushu first and then Tokyo, which was the capital, of course. Um, so for all of this, there was no sign of surrender. And yet the Allies were looking at the potential of millions and millions of casualties occurring at, if they attempted to land on to uh, invade the home islands of Japan. Um, so at the same time that all of this had been happening, there was a great investment on the part of the Germans prior to their defeat, of course, in nuclear weaponry. The Germans had a program called Uranverein, which means the Uranium Club, in which they were trying to create a working nuclear reactor with the expectation, the direct expectation, that if they could create a stable nuclear reaction, they could create a nuclear weapon. Their scientists were the most advanced, their engineers were the most advanced. Germany had, had the most developed science programs in the world, and nuclear physics was one of the areas they were, they were definitely working on. This is a photograph of a reactor um, that they never did get to work. They're actually taking it apart in this picture near Heidelberg. But they were actively working on this. They had developed um, high-grade uranium uh, extraction. They had developed a heavy water plant, deuterium uh, D2O. It's basically a hydrogen, a water molecule that has an extra um, proton in the nucleus. And so it, it's heavy water they thought would be necessary in order to control and sustain a nuclear reaction. And they thought that it would require, at this early stage in the German work, that it would require a large quantity of uranium to be able to create a nuclear explosion. Later on we discovered you didn't, you didn't need a large quantity of radioactive material to create a nuclear explosion, and you did not require something to sustain the reaction, like heavy water. But they had heavy water plants that they had, had taken over in, um, in Scandinavia, and they were working very hard on this uh, for the good fortune, as far as the Allies were concerned, is that Hitler assigned Albert Speer, 
to oversee the development of nuclear weapons. Well, Albert Speer was not a scientist. He was an architect. He is the one that had designed the plans for the future of Berlin and all of that. Well, he did not understand the science. He did not understand the potential. And so after the invasion of Poland, they reached a place where they were really needing um, more frontline soldiers. And so he took all the scientists, made them privates, and gave them rifles and sent them to the front. Which, thank you, Albert. You know, we appreciate that. Had they continued to work on the project, they, that they might very well have developed nuclear weapons before they did in the West. Um, the, in October of 1939, there, there were a lot of uh, European scientists that had worked on this or were aware of it, had escaped from Europe, and were trying to warn the West that Germany was very close to having a, a weapon of absolute devastation, what we call a weapon of mass destruction today. And in October of 1939, uh, Albert Einstein wrote a letter to Franklin Delano Roosevelt in which he introduced him to the idea that there was a new field of physics, nuclear physics, that had the very real potential of developing a devastating uh, weapon. Well, FDR wasn't that sure about it, but it was Einstein after all, and he already had gained great fame at that point by 1939. And so. FDR appointed some people to a committee called the Committee for the Development of Substitute Materials, which is a really sexy name, I think. The uh, <laughs> Committee for the Development of Substitute Materials. Later on, they changed the name because they realized as they started working on it that substitute materials, people might understand that they were looking for something to substitute for standard explosives. And so they changed the name to the Manhattan Development Project. They called it that because the um, FDR, once they began to make some progress, he had the military assign this project to develop this to the Army Corps of Engineers. And the office that was working on it was the Manhattan office of the Army Corps of Engineers, eventually became called just the Manhattan Project. So it was a joint effort to be done by the <coughs> Army Corps of Engineers and um, the private scientists. This is, at this point, Major General. He had been a colonel, and they promoted him because they figured he needed to be a general in order to have the kind of uh, weight that he would need. He had a lot of weight, apparently. Um, and this is Robert Oppenheimer, who was the primary scientist, the lead scientist. They began to develop this, and when the scientists got involved in it, Enrico Fermi was involved. The first thing they did was they created the first stable nuclear reaction under the bleachers at the University of Chicago. So if you ever go to a ball game at the University of Chicago, remember what's underneath you. They created this reactor, and uh, a, a number of scientists were involved. Some of those scientists came over and started working with the, um, the project to try to create a nuclear weapon, and there were a number of major locations in the United States. There really were three processes. The, uh, in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, they were involved in extracting uranium-235 um, from uranium-238. It's an isotope, which is much, uh, much more appropriate for what they were trying to do for a, a, a radioactive material nuclear reaction. And yet it's very difficult to separate those two things out. And so all of the, the facilities that the Army Corps of Engineers built at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, was purely that, an effort to try to uh, pull out, separate uranium-235 from the more common uranium-238. So that's what they did at Oak Ridge. The other thing was not too long before this, they had discovered a new element, which was actually an isotope of uh, uranium, which was called plutonium. And in Washington State, at Hanford, Washington, they began to develop plutonium. Plutonium was easier to develop than it was to extract uranium-235 from its combination with uranium-238. So those two locations were responsible for developing the fuel that would actually cause the nuclear reaction. At the same time, in New Mexico, in uh, Los Alamos, New Mexico, and later on they did testing at Alamogordo, uh, but in Los Alamos they developed the, that was the main site where the scientists were working on how to build the thing. Once they had the materials uh, for the explosion, which were being developed, uh, uranium in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and plutonium in Hanford, Washington, they had to have some way to create the reaction within a device. So they began to develop the, uh, the, the process by which this explosion could take place. In all, the, the Army Corps of Engineers was responsible for building all the facilities and providing the materials, and then the scientists were supposed to develop the means to make this happen, to, to perfect the explosion uh, that they were looking for. It was ultra-secret, and unfortunately, 
uh, Stalin had a spy who was part of the Manhattan Project, and so Stalin knew about this all the way along. That's why when finally, right before the, the first bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, and uh, Harry Truman, at one of the meetings that he and, and Stalin and Roosevelt and uh, Churchill had, the when he told him we have you know we have just completed development of a, a bomb which will be used um, if necessary against Japan, and Stalin said, "Oh well, that's nice. That will works for you," and he didn't seem surprised at all, and they made note of that. Well, it's because he knew more about it in detail than Truman did because he had a spy involved in the. And so in 19, by 1949, they had developed their own nuclear weapon in the Soviet Union based on all that. But, so all of this work is being done. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers invested $2 billion in developing these uh, plants and, and uh, camps, the various things they were using, which is the equivalent of $22 billion today. 130,000 people were employed, and yet, with the exception of that Soviet spy, they did a very good job of maintaining secrecy. This is one of the billboards that people would see as they left the the um, Alamogordo facility, it says, it's the three monkeys, and it says, what you see here, what you do here, what you hear here, when you leave here, let it stay here. So there was a massive campaign to try to make sure the secrecy, one of the reasons that they put the plant out in Alamogordo, New Mexico, is there was nothing close by. I mean, it was kind of a self-sustaining community there um, because they wanted it to be isolated. So this was the Manhattan Project, and they worked on it, the, eventually, they decided that both the uranium-type bomb and a plutonium-type bomb had the potential for working. They had much more confidence in the uranium bomb, and they were of two different designs. Um, the uranium bomb, which was first, whoops, first called Thin Man, and later on changed, when they, they redesigned it, they called the, the latest version Little Boy, so that in the records they would have some distinction as to which one they were talking about. So Little Boy was a uranium bomb, and it's called a gun-type uranium bomb, which meant there was a, a tube inside that a, a, an explosion would fire and drive uranium down this tube, and when it came in contact with other fissionable materials at the other end of the tube, it would create the reaction. Um, the second type of bomb, which was a plutonium bomb, was completely different design. It was an implosion type. Explosions within that, which is why it's fatter, rounder, would compress to the center and the compression would cause the plutonium to explode. They weren't sure that the plutonium bomb would work. They were pretty confident about the uranium bomb, but the fact is that all of this was done so quickly at the end that they were never sure what was gonna happen um, when, when these things were, were dropped. This thing up here, and you can tell the size because there's a man sitting here next to it, this is called the gadget. This was a test version of the plutonium implosion bomb because they were not as sure that the implosion bomb would work and they felt they needed to test it. And so they had what was called the Trinity test on July 16th of 1945 in, um, the, in New Mexico. And it was considered the birth that day, July 16th, because it was the first nuclear explosion uh, that had ever occurred. That's considered really the birth of the nuclear age. The, um, when the gadget was set off, when this explosive device was set off in a tower, and this was, this was the, uh, the actual photograph of the explosion, they were not sure what was gonna happen. But what happened was the uh, people could see the blinding flash 200 miles away, windows were blown out of private homes 100 miles away, there was a 40,000 foot mushroom cloud, and for a half a mile in the desert, the sand had been turned to glass. So there was a half mile wide crater that was glass after this. Um, you've probably seen the videos of these guys standing out there with goggles on when the explosion goes off and they're sort of, well, they had no idea how powerful it was going to be. And in fact, um, you know, today they can put a nuclear bomb in a briefcase because they, you know, they're, they learned how to make them much more efficient. Uh, the Hiroshima bomb, uh, the little boy, they, it exploded with 1.7% efficiency, which means it could have been 50 times a larger explosion if they really had known what they were doing um, with that amount of uranium that was used. It was 161 pounds of uranium. And uh, so they were, this was barely perfected. And in fact, it was July 16th that they did the test, and it was only the following August 6th that they dropped the first bomb. So we're talking about less than three weeks later.
So they were very much on a fast track. Um, and again, the idea was that Japan had shown no sign of surrender and they were looking at this extraordinary cost of life, both uh, allied and Japanese, if they did try to invade um, Japan from the sea. So they had prepared on the islands of Tinian, and again, Tinian was, uh, you can't really see it down here, uh, along the island chain along with Guam and uh, Saipan, they had been launching the B-29 bomber strikes from Tinian for quite a while, and again had destroyed uh, an estimated, well, 67 cities, or had significant damage, um, including 100,000 dead in one night in Tokyo from firebombing, um, extraordinary devastation. So they prepared at Tinian, right after the test of the bomb, the various ships delivered very piece, various pieces of this to Tinian Island. Uh, one of them, the Indianapolis, who just delivered some of the nuclear materials and whatnot, was actually torpedoed and sunk after that. You may have heard about it. It's, um, if you saw Jaws, you know, when the guy is talking about how, um, you know, he was aboard, he says he was aboard the Indianapolis, and the Richard Drivers character said, you were on the Indianapolis? because when the ship was torpedoed, 800 men went in the water, most of them ended up being killed by sharks because it was a secret mission delivering the weapons and so they didn't know where they were. Uh, and it took them days to find them. And uh, most of them were killed by sharks by the time they, they, somebody finally got there. So anyway, just a little side note, next time you're watching Jaws, you can think about that. <laughs> that that's, what the, that's what that ship, the Indianapolis was doing is delivering materials for the nuclear weapons to Tinian. Um, this is the Enola Gay, which was the, uh, the super fortress that was committed to drop the first bomb. Paul Tibbetts, here in the middle, was the pilot. The Enola, Gay was, uh, Enola Gay was his mother's name. And so they, um, they were trained in this special mission. Only two people, Tibbetts and the primary technician that went along, knew what they were doing, that this was not just an ordinary bomb raid. The others knew there was something weird going on, but they did not know until the bomb was dropped and they saw the explosion that this was something very, very different. Um, on the 6th of August, and again, this is less than three weeks after the test of uh, the Trinity test of the gadget bomb, the Enola Gay took off early in the morning with Paul Tibbetts um, flying it. They, the primary target they had was Hiroshima. And Hiroshima had not been bombed previously because the bombing had only been going on of the, of the cities of Japan, the firebombing, since the previous summer. And they had left Hiroshima because by that time they felt like if we develop this weapon, we need some place to test it where it would be very clear what the damage is from this bomb in order to have the effect that they wanted, which was to, to create um, you know, a, a real desire to surrender rather than suffer this again. So Hiroshima was a major military and uh, manufacturing center. It was the home of the second general army under Field Marshal uh, Hata. They, they were responsible for the defense of the whole southern islands of Japan. So any assault to Kyushu in the south would have been uh, primarily against this force. They were also the headquarters for the 59th Army, the 5th and 2nd Divisions. It was a major supply and logistics center for the Japanese military. It was a communication center, a key shipping port, so it was a, a major military installation in Hiroshima. Um, the population had, was about 340 to 350,000 people on August 6th, um, and so when they took off from, from Tinian, they arrived over Hiroshima at about 8.15 in the morning. They dropped the, uh, the atomic bomb. It was designed to explode about 1,900 feet above ground, which it did. It exploded with a force equivalent to between 12 and 15,000 tons of TNT. Now remember, it was only 1.7% efficient. It could have been 50 times more than that if they had, you know, if it was later on when they developed more efficient ways of doing this. And this was the uranium-235 gun type weapon from in, the, in Little Boy. Um, it's estimated that 80 to 90,000 people were killed immediately. Um, tens of thousands more, uh, totaling about 146,000, they believe, although the estimates are not, they're only estimates, they don't have exact numbers. 146,000 eventually died. 
between both those who were killed immediately and the, those who died from burns or injuries or radi radiation later. Nobody really understood radiation poisoning at that point. Um, and so 90% of the center of Hiroshima was destroyed five square miles. And um, so absolutely devastating, of course. This is what Hiroshima looked like in an aerial picture that was taken earlier. This is exactly the same shot taken after the bomb was dropped. There's nothing there. Um, there are a couple of buildings, and I'll show you in a minute, that survived because they were reinforced concrete, but most of Hiroshima, like most of the cities in uh, Japan, were built out of wood. Uh, they were timber buildings, and so the bomb flattened five square miles, and uh, no one survived in the epicenter, or hypocenter, they call it, for a bomb. Um, and so this is exactly, in fact, the, the target that they had, they, this, there's a T-shaped bridge right here. If you go to Hiroshima now, you can see that because this is all part of the Peace Park, as it's called now. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. So um, the destruction was quite extraordinary, obviously, and yet no note of surrender was forthcoming. So that was on the 6th of August. On the 8th of August, the Soviet Union declared war against Japan, as they had promised the Allies they would do, and they invaded across the border into Manchuria and then all the way down into Korea, which we'll talk about when we talk about the Korean War. Since nothing was forthcoming, three days after the bombing of Hiroshima, the decision was made to bomb, uh, to drop a second nuclear weapon, which was really all they had at that point. They had the materials to develop another one, but it would have been several weeks before they could create another bomb. Part of the thinking was that Japan isn't surrendering because they thought we only had one, um, that, the, that the need was there to demonstrate the fact that this potential destruction was not limited to just the one explosion over Hiroshima, as terrible as that had been. So the decision was made to drop a second bomb on the 9th, three days after Hiroshima, and the day after the, Rus the Soviet Union invaded uh, against Japan, and the first choice was uh, Kokuro, which was a, a, a center that, and yet when they actually flew over it, they, they flew over Kokuro three times and could not see the target because it was too cloudy. Um, the, the commitment was that they would not drop the bomb unless they could see the target. Uh, they did not want to make a mistake about uh, it being somewhere off target. I mean, it was terrible enough that they actually got close to where they intended to. But, um, the, and by the way, the British had agreed to the dropping of the bomb. There was a Quebec agreement between Great Britain and the United States. The United States had taken over the nuclear program called Tube Alloys, all these secret names, from Britain, and they had uh, used their resources to help develop it. And so the agreement was that Churchill would have to agree before it happened, and he did. He was notified by Truman, and he agreed to it. Nagasaki was one of the largest seaports in uh, southern Japan. It had great significance for military because it was a place that both both uh, developed ordnance, ships, military equipment, other war equipment. It had been bombed five times on a small scale, but not a lot of destruction. Importantly for Nagasaki, it is very different. The topography is different, very different than Hiroshima. The central part of Hiroshima is all quite flat. They have some hills further out. But Nagasaki is built in the middle of a bunch of hills. And so on the 9th, when uh, Kokuro, the primary target, was covered in clouds, they made the decision to go to the alternate target, which was Nagasaki. They dropped the bomb over Nagasaki. It was a plutonium-239 bomb, a fat man, as it was called. It weighed almost 10,000 pounds, and it produced a 22 kilo uh, kiloton blast, which was almost twice as powerful as the one that over Hiroshima. But the destruction was not nearly as great because it was limited by the hills that, that are, are in and around Nagasaki. So the topography reduced the destruction to 2.6 miles, just, just about half what it was in Hiroshima. 39,000 people were killed immediately and an estimated 80,000 people died over um, the next four to five months. This is what Nagasaki looked like before the bomb was dropped. This is what it looked like after the bomb was dropped. Now you'll notice right here, this is a church, um, and Urajima Church. It was a, Nagasaki was the site of more Christians than any other city, and that's still true today, any other city in Japan. Um, and they had a very large Catholic church there. And it was significantly damaged, but was rebuilt. In fact, 
Um, this is the, the photograph of the bomb over Hiroshima. This is the one over, over Nagasaki. In addition to the planes that dropped the bombs, the Enola Gay over Hiroshima and Boxcar was the name of the plane that dropped the bomb over Nagasaki. They had two other B-29s along with them, one with, with um, technical instrumentation in order to measure the force of the blast and other things, and one was entirely photographic. They, they took images um, of the explosions. But this is the only, the primary building, the largest building that was left standing in Hiroshima, which was the prefecture building, and it is still there. It's now called the Peace Dome. It is part of the Hiroshima Park. Um, this is uh, what happened to the um, Urajima, uh, Urajima Church, Catholic Church. And so this gives you an idea of this was, is Hiroshima after the blast. There were a few buildings that were left standing, but uh, very, very few. And again, this is what the church, um, Urajima Church looked like then. It has been completely rebuilt so that it now um, same design, it has a, a twin metal cupolas uh, of the towers of the church. This was what the prefecture building in uh, Hiroshima looked like after the bomb. This is what it looks like today. They have left it pretty much as it was, although they rebuilt the, uh, the church in Nagasaki. They left the prefecture as the Peace Dome and it's now part of the Peace Park. So that, those are the differences in terms of how they dealt with that. Both, both cities now have Atomic bomb museums that tell the story. Uh, both have peace parks, which support and advocate the uh, the elimination of nuclear weapons around the world. And this is what Nagasaki looked like as well. Um, you know, this this one Buddhist sculpture was left, uh, and this one here, but the devastation was quite complete. Now today, if you if you go to Nagasaki and Hiroshima and the museums there, and you read the descriptions, they follow the line of um, an American historian named Gar Alperovitz. Um, and Alperovitz in 1965, so 20 years after the dropping of the bombs, he proposed that the reason the nuclear weapons were dropped were because of what he called nuclear diplomacy, that the Americans wanted to demonstrate to Russia what their power, what their capabilities were because Truman had committed himself to try to limit the expansion of communism and uh, the Soviet Union was the primary advocate for expanding communism and so the idea of dropping the bombs according to to this uh, Alperovitz the, the, was to try to impress or frighten the Russians. This is what you will now read on, in the museums in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Um, I think that may have been one small factor because clearly Truman was committed to, to not allowing communism to continue to expand. But I believe the two primary factors that were involved is one, despite all of the destruction, 67 major cities in Japan destroyed, um, the, the horrendous bloodiness of the battles getting worse and worse and worse the closer they got to the islands, the home islands of Japan, the, the acts of uh, commitment or even desperation using kamikaze pilots and children as soldiers, the idea that uh, Japan had shown no indication that they were intending or willing to surrender, that they were prepared according to their sort of warped view of the Code of Bushido, the way of the warrior, that they would die to the last man and the last civilian even, rather than surrender. Add that to the fact that the estimates were that there would be four million American casualties um, in, and probably between 10 and 20 million Japanese casualties if an attempt was made to try to invade the home islands of Japan, I believe those were the primary factors that were that determined the willingness to drop the nuclear weapons. It still is a horrendous thing, but the um, the question is, and I think the decision was made based upon the fact they thought it would be much worse, and the realization that 100,000 people had been killed in Tokyo in firebombing in one night, um, Jap Japan did not seem willing to surrender, uh, apart from anything really horrendous, and so that was part of it. So August 9th, Nagasaki bomb was dropped. August 15th, the emperor um, has a recording of his voice played in Japan in which he accepts unconditional surrender. And September 2nd, the USS Missouri uh, was the signing of the document. Yes? Uh, well, I would say that, uh, uh, to support your theory, my mother was a survivor of the Nagasaki bomb. Wow. My father was in the 2nd Marine Division, Pacific Fighting. 
Because they both very bad locations that you mentioned that only have a big blast. And uh, they both agree that it saved numerous lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of the, the will and determination of the Japanese to not give up and, uh, and the destruction and the, the damage that my father saw of how, how hard they fought and they were right. trying to run. So in layman's terms, that, that uh, people that experienced it, they firmly believe that that was true. Right. Yeah. That, that, um, in addition, and a lot of people don't realize this, that a large portion of the Imperial Japanese Army, again, most of the battles in the Pacific that the United States and other forces, the Australians, the British, were fighting against the Japanese, was against the Imperial Japanese Navy. The largest portion of the Imperial Japanese Army was still in China and was still intact. Um, and so a lot of the military forces in Japan were saying, we don't need to surrender because we can bring all those troops back over. The fact that they had no fuel for their ships, the ships were pretty much stuck in port. They had very few airplanes or pilots left. They were still prepared to fight on the ground because they felt like they still had an army to do that with. And that was another factor. Is It's not like they had been defeated to the point that a ground, uh, and a ground assault in Japan would not have opposition. Other questions about any of that? Yes? Right. Is there any evidence that actually happened? That they demonstrated the bomb? No, that they offered Well, the, 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 there was discussion about um, should we drop the bomb somewhere that's not populated in order to show the potential. But there were a couple of reasons why they decided not to do that. One is, uh, after all the destruction that had already occurred um, in the cities, they, the Japanese were not willing to, to surrender or even to indicate a willingness to consider surrender uh, at that point. We, we know a lot now that we didn't know then, or that they didn't know then. And so the decision was made that the atomic bomb needed to create a level of destruction, including human destruction, unfortunately, or else it would not be taken seriously, that the Japanese would interpret it as a lack of willingness on the part of the Americans to, to drop a bomb in a way that would cause human casualties. And so they were fearful that if they tried that, if they dropped the bomb somewhere where there weren't people, that Japan would actually think, oh, well, they won't use it against civilians. They won't use it against against a city. And so that might have actually backfired and gone the other direction. But there was consideration of that at the time. Uh, you know, is, is that a possibility? There were other ideas. Douglas MacArthur advocated that they continue firebomb the cities. Um, and But again, we're looking at hundreds and hundreds of thousands of casualties. Uh, potentially millions of casualties if they had continued along that line. And so part of the decision was made that the least casualties at this point that had the greatest likelihood of ending the war was to drop the nuclear weapons. And when no reaction was given to the first bomb, the concern was that uh, after Hiroshima that they may have thought, well, they only have one, so there's no further danger. And when they didn't respond, they didn't get any message back on that, then they decided we need to demonstrate that there's for, there's the potential for further destruction. And so that's why the second bomb was dropped. Yes, Joe. Yesterday we spoke about uh, the fact that the Allies had the code. How long did they have that before the Japanese found out? And what happened with that? The Japanese never did find out. You know, the Allies continued to break their code throughout the war. and. Uh, that the only time that really made a huge difference, I mean, once we actually landed on an island, because from Guadalcanal on, um, the Western powers were on the offensive against Japan. The only time that really made a big difference is early on in the war, when the Japanese were on the offensive, we knew where they were gonna strike, and particularly where their, where their naval uh, forces were going to be applied. And so that made a difference then, but once it was a matter of us on the offense, us being Western powers, you know, the, the Allied powers, on the offense and the Japanese on the defense, there really wasn't any content in those codes that made a difference, but we were still able to read any of the communiques. And again, knowing that and knowing that we were able to, we were not getting any indication, we being, again, the Allied forces, any indication that Japan was seriously considering surrender. And they kept hoping for some word that this would end. Uh, the only change that was made, again, Japan's hope was that they would be able to negotiate a more uh, more satisfied, from their per per perspective, uh, surrender agreement, rather than non-unconditional, because the Potsdam Declaration from the Allies was that Japan had to surrender unconditionally. And the to the Japanese ear, that meant 
you're going to get rid of the emperor, you're going to try him for war crimes, you're going to destroy our way of life, you're going to... Well, they actually made one change to the Potsdam uh, insistence on uh, unconditional surrender, and that is they, they added the wording that uh, they required unconditional surrender of the Japanese military. That's as far as they were willing to go without making it look like they were backpedaling so much that the Japanese might take that as a sign of weakness or a sign of the fact they were, were not committed to doing what was required to end the war. But they did that so that the Japanese, hopefully, they thought would interpret that as being, we're not going to, you know, we're not looking, we're not gunning for the emperor, we're not trying to change your way of life, but the military has to unconditionally surrender uh, because it was a fear that they would, if they didn't, that there would be further uh, ramifications that the army in China, for instance, could potentially still mount a um, further war. So, other questions? Yes? Well, the uh, surrender announcement came from the emperor instead mm -hmm. of the, uh, the Japanese military government. Right. Does it mean that Japanese military still want to uh, fight to Right. The announcement was from the emperor, not from the from the military government. At that point, the military government was split almost evenly. Half of them were advocating surrender. Um, they still hoped to get better terms of surrender, but they knew that surrender was inevitable, and so they were pushing for it. The other half, uh, the hardcore um, military side of the government, they had a council of war. Uh, they were in favor of fighting to the last person, and so. Because of that deadlock, and they tried for, for several weeks to come up with some, you know, some way to negotiate that, um, and were not successful. Both sides dug in their heels, and neither side would really give. And so finally, the emperor called this group together, which was unheard of. And he told them, in very short terms, we are going to accept the unconditional surrender, as difficult as it is. And then he walked out of the room, so that there would be no argument about it. And Several of the major military leaders committed seppuku. Uh, at first they were saying, well, should we refuse the emperor? Should we still maintain it? Some of them advocated, of uh, the senior command, advocated continuing even if it meant a coup against the emperor, that they continue the war rather than surrender. And finally, the uh, sort of more settled heads uh, prevailed, and they agreed, no, they couldn't do that. But then several of the major military leaders ended up committing seppuku. Um, then there was a junior military, uh, you know, junior officers tried to rebel. They believed that it wasn't really the emperor who said this or that the emperor had been forced to. And when that was quelled by the senior military guys who had already decided we need to do this, the emperor, you know, has the, has the authority, although he doesn't usually get involved in this, if he says we're going to do it, we'll do it. Then there was a student rebellion, a student coup that tried to take over some of the military barracks because they didn't believe that the emperor would ever surrender. So this sort of uh, nationalistic, militaristic kind of attitude really had seeped into all of society. It wasn't that, there, that it was a, a group at the top that was forcing everybody else to do this. That's part of, that was part of the problem. Uh, but it was the emperor's voice. Uh, they actually put it on a, a record, a vinyl record. Uh, they recorded it on a vinyl record. And there were attacks in two different locations where they thought that record was being kept in an attempt to try to, to take it and destroy it before it got played. Um, and yet they were successful in playing it on the radio. And so for the first time, for most Japanese, they actually heard the voice of the emperor. And interestingly, the emperor used a type of Japanese that for us would be probably comparable to Old English. There was a formal kind of uh, Japanese that was used in only the most formal settings. Well, that's the language that the emperor used. And so a lot of Japanese didn't really understand a lot of what he was saying, but they got the gist of it. Um, and so um, it was... It went into effect. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, the the spies in the Manhattan Project, uh, they were uh, eventually tried and executed, weren't they? Well, you're you're thinking of the Rosen uh, the Rosenbergs. Yeah. They they were involved in um, apparently transferring some secrets, but there was a one spy in particular whose name I want to say Albert something. Um, what's that? Freunds. 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 Okay. Yeah, um, that there was one man who was involved in the project who primarily was responsible for giving the plans. There were others, like the Rosenbergs, that apparently had delivered other materials related to the Manhattan Project, but the primary information came from one guy who I don't think was ever caught or, or tried. Um, we found out about it later, that he was the one that had committed.
I don't think he was ever tried, if I remember correctly. Um, so, yeah. Yes? Could you comment on the role of the Navajo code speakers on the allied side? Right, the Navajo um, code speakers, the, the Navajo language is very complex, apparently, and for reasons that I couldn't get into because I'm not a cryptographer, uh, apparently, the native Navajo speakers had a unique ability because of their language background to be able to um, do cryptography, that is, to, to break codes. And so there were, in the Pacific War, there were a number of Navajo speakers, and there, there was a, war, a, a movie with Nicolas Cage about this, um, that they were considered highly valued because they had a quite astonishing ability to break code, and they were involved in helping break the Japanese code. I don't have a lot more information than that on, on those, uh, but yes? Sir. But, uh, my understanding from the Navajo code breakers, not only did they break codes, but they also were able to communicate, mm -hmm. yeah. and their code could not be broken. Right. And they had a military person with each one of them that if they were to be captured, that military person would shoot them. Exactly, so yeah. They couldn't be captured. It's true, and they were actually assigned in the field. I mean, they, they weren't sitting in headquarters somewhere. They're, the Navajo code, uh, code talkers were actually in the field um, and were involved in creating messages from place to place because they, they were able to create a code that the Japanese could not break. And I think they had the written language, and that made it huh? They didn't have a written language. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I know very little about it, uh, but it's fascinating and you know what all is involved in that. In fact, one of the major factors in winning of the war in Europe was the fact that the British captured an Enigma code machine. I mean, there were, other, there were a couple of them that captured it, but the first one was the, the British captured one, and the Polish were involved in helping figure out how it worked. And that ability, because the Nazis were so convinced that no one could ever uh, break the Enigma code, the fact that they broke it made a huge difference in Europe, and the fact that we were able to read the codes of the Japanese made a huge difference in the Pacific. In both cases, those were major factors in Allied victory in the war. So, Thank you all very much. We will be back this afternoon for Japanese Art and Architecture. Thank you.